In this episode, we'll discuss an algorithmic approach to diarrhea. When you have a patient with diarrhea, what is the first decision point question? To figure out if diarrhea is acute or chronic. What is the definition of acute diarrhea? Is a diarrhea lasting less than two weeks? And chronic diarrhea is the one lasting more than four weeks. There is a subacute or persistent diarrhea that we will discuss briefly, and that's the one that lasts beyond the two week period but is not longer than four weeks. What should be the focus of history and physical examination in patients with diarrhea? First and foremost, duration, as we mentioned, but also severity that is explained as the frequency of bowel movements, presence or absence of associated symptoms, any type of exposure or underlying conditions. In physical exam, the first thing to be checked is volume status, followed, of course, by abdominal exam and the presence or absence of symptoms or signs indicative of inflammatory diarrhea such as changes in vital signs like fever, positive fecal or cold blood testing, or severe abdominal pain. You have a patient with acute diarrhea. What are the important three decision point questions approaching any patient with acute diarrhea? Three important questions include one, initial management options, including initial tests and uh, treatment options. Two, if the patient has any contraindications to antidiarrheal or antibiotic treatment. And three, if the patient needs any special tests such as special culture media or stool for ova and parasites. You have a patient with acute diarrhea. Describe the initial assessment and plan for this patient. Beginning with initial labs. Talking about resource-rich settings, we begin with stool culture and white BCs as well as stool lactoferrin, as well as shiga toxin and shiga-like toxin testing. For the treatment, we have the three-tier treatment that is fluid rehydration for all patients, antidiarrheals when no contraindication present, and antibiotics also when there is no contraindications. For a more detailed discussion, please review the Traveler's Diarrhea episode. Just a reminder, do you remember what is the major contraindication to antibiotic treatment in acute diarrhea? A child with bloody diarrhea who has no fever, especially with the presence of risk factors for enterohemorrhagic E. coli, is the surest contraindication for antibiotic treatment in diarrhea. Now, while we mentioned decision about initial management as well as assessment of contraindications and the need for special media are the initial general management options, what are the major two decision point questions for treatment of acute diarrhea? One is to figure out if we are dealing with inflammatory or non-inflammatory diarrhea and the other is if there is indication or contraindication for antidiarrheals and antibiotics. Now talking about special tests requirements in acute diarrhea, I have a couple cases to discuss here. And the first case is a patient with acute onset profuse watery diarrhea five days after hospitalization. In addition to the initial management options, what additional assessment is required in this patient? This is a typical case for C. diff diarrhea or C. diff colitis, and therefore we need to choose one of the two commonly used tests for Clostridium difficile. These include either stool say for C. diff toxin or stool PCR for C. diff itself. Next case still deals with the same patient after you have ordered the previously mentioned stool tests. What is the next step in the assessment of this patient? Remember, C. diff diarrhea requires initiation of empiric antibiotic treatment with vancomycin. Can you give example of other conditions or pathogens that require special culture media? Pathogens such as Vibrio, Listeria, and Yersinia.
put it simple, any diarrheal pathogen that's not included in routine school culture. And always remember, routine stool culture includes Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter jejuni. For example, if you have a patient with symptoms of pseudoappendicitis indicating higher likelihood of Yersinia intercolitica, we need to order special culture. Same is true if diarrhea is happening in immunocompromised or in extremes of age indicating the likelihood of listeria. Again, for more precise and more detailed discussion of the risk factors of infectious diarrhea, refer to that episode. Next case is a patient with acute diarrhea who was initially evaluated by the initial tests that we mentioned and was sent back home with supportive care and antidiarrheal agents. However, he comes back to ER complaining of no response to treatment for three weeks. What's the next step in the assessment of the area in this patient? Now, this patient is in the window of two to four weeks. That's referred to as persistent or subacute diarrhea. Also, this patient's initial evaluation was negative. These are two common indications for assessment of stool for ova and parasites. Now, what are the other indications for stool assessment for ova and parasite? These include, again, as we mentioned, persistent or subacute diarrhea, stool leukocyte or lactoferrin negative in a patient with bloody diarrhea, diarrhea in immunocompromised patients, especially AIDS patients with CD4 less than 200, or diarrhea in homosexual men, and finally, diarrheal cases that happen in community water outbreaks require assessment of stool for ova and parasite. Now let's move to chronic diarrhea. You have a patient with diarrhea lasting more than a month. What are the first two decision point questions approaching this patient with chronic diarrhea? First and foremost, we need to figure out if the patient has any alarm symptoms indicating a non-functional cause of chronic diarrhea. That's an organic cause of chronic diarrhea. And then if the patient has any of the organic causes, we need to figure out to what category of the organic chronic diarrhea the patient belongs to. So let's simplify it in terms of a case. You have a patient with chronic diarrhea, presence of what symptoms or signs indicates a need for further workup and evaluation. If the patient has an age of onset for his or her chronic diarrhea to be older than 50 years, if the patient has rectal blood or melina, if the patient has nocturnal symptoms or progressive abdominal pain, if there is complaint of unexplained weight loss, if the initial lab assessment of chronic diarrhea is abnormal, and if the patient has a first degree relative with IBD or colorectal cancer. So let me formulate a case. You have a patient with chronic diarrhea and fecal occult blood testing is positive. What is the next step? The next step is colonoscopy. You have a patient with chronic diarrhea who has unexplained weight loss and nocturnal pain or progressive abdominal pain. What is the next step in the assessment of this patient? Colonoscopy. Put it simple, if a patient has any of these alarm features, the next step in the management is colonoscopy. Describe the initial workup of chronic diarrhea. First step is to rule out presence of any alarm feature that requires endoscopic evaluation. If alarm features are not present, the initial lab tests are performed. What are the initial lab tests of chronic diarrhea assessment? They include CBC with differential and electrolytes, ESR and CRP, fecal occult blood test and fecal calprotectin, and finally TSH and celiac serology.
Now, if neither of the initial endoscopic evaluation nor the initial lab tests are diagnostic, what's the next step? We perform second line tests that usually include some advanced imaging such as abdominal CT, stool tests for different types of infection, and also blood tests for malabsorption syndromes. Now, I would like to finish this episode by discussing major categories of chronic diarrhea with a couple cases. You have a patient with high volume chronic diarrhea that fails to respond to fasting and you perform the initial lab assessment of chronic diarrhea. What you expect to see in the result of this patient's stool osmolal gap assessment Remember, high volume diarrhea with no change in fasting or no response to fasting indicates secretory diarrhea and in secretory diarrhea, still a small gap is usually within normal limits. This is sometimes referred to as low stool or small gap or a small gap less than 50. Can you provide examples of secretory diarrhea? Well, as the name indicates, we are dealing with conditions associated with increased secretion into the GI lumen. Also remember, secretory or high volume chronic diarrhea is usually due to a pathology in small intestine. And examples include hormones such as VIPoma or gastrinoma, toxins such as those produced by some causes of infectious diarrhea, However, those usually cause acute secretory type diarrhea. And then we have congenital or absorptive defects such as cystic fibrosis or impaled bile acid absorption seen in resection of terminal ileum. Another case is a patient with chronic high volume diarrhea several weeks after cholecystectomy. True or false, this patient's stool or small gap is elevated. That's false. Remember, post cholecystectomy diarrhea is an example of secretory diarrhea with normal or low stool small or gap, and the mechanism of increased secretion is impaired enterohepatic circulation after cholecystectomy. Always remember, presence of bile acids in the mucosa of GI tract causes secretory diarrhea by direct stimulation. What are the examples of condition with chronic diarrhea in which stool or small gap is elevated? Now we are dealing with osmotic diarrhea, the type of diarrhea that responds to fasting. And examples include lactose intolerance, as well as use or abuse of antacids. Remember assessment of stool small or gap as well as response to fasting comes handy only when we want to differentiate between osmotic versus secretory diarrhea. However, we have at least five major other categories of chronic diarrhea. What are they? We have inflammatory type chronic diarrhea, we have diarrhea due to malabsorption, we have diarrhea due to motility disorder, and finally we have chronic infectious diarrhea. So let me ask you another case. You have a patient with chronic diarrhea and weight loss. What are the next step considerations in the assessment of this patient? Well, if fecal occult blood test is positive or if the patient is old, we may want to assess for cancer. Otherwise, especially in a younger patient with negative fecal occult blood tests, we would like to rule out malabsorption as the cause of chronic diarrhea and therefore we perform malabsorption tests including fecal fat. Increased levels of fecal fat will be diagnostic for malabsorption. Final case of this episode is a patient who is referred to your office from psychiatry clinic with the diagnosis of illness and anxiety disorder and chronic diarrhea.
when you interview the patient you figure out that one of his family members died of gastric cancer and the patient consumes a lot of antacids with the hope to avoid gastric pathology. You order initial lab tests for assessment of his diarrhea and you figure out that he has high stool or small bowel gap. What is the substance that he is abusing? Please remember the word factitious diarrhea or diarrhea secondary to antacid abuse could be either osmotic or secretory. By definition, if the patient abuses laxatives, he will have a secretory type diarrhea with normal stool or small gap and no response to fasting. However, if the patient abuses magnesium containing compounds, he will have osmotic diarrhea as the case of this patient. Remember, magnesium containing laxatives are also falling under category of laxative abuse. So pay more attention to the substance involved instead of the term association. Laxative abuse diarrhea could be secretory if it is non-magnesium based compound or it could be osmotic with high or small gap if it is due to magnesium compounds. Finally, if all categories fail and you also rule out these categories of factitious diarrhea and medication induced diarrhea, the diagnosis will be functional and that means irritable bowel syndrome as the underlying cause of chronic diarrhea. So put it simple, when you have patients with acute diarrhea, you need to figure out if the patient has indication for antidiarrheals or antibiotics and if the patient needs any specific tests. When you are dealing with chronic diarrhea, you need to figure out if the patient has alarm symptoms or if the patient belongs to any of the major category of chronic diarrhea, including osmotic, secretory, malabsorptive, laxative abuse and factitious or functional diarrhea. And if the patient has alarm symptoms, you perform colonoscopy. Otherwise, you go, you go with your routine evaluation. And this is approach to diarrhea.